Have you ever wondered how one soldier's cannonball experience changed the world? Let me take you back in history and discover how St. Ignatius of Loyola and the Jesuits set the world on fire through their mission, particularly here in Cebu. I am Mr. Matt Erickson Malagar, and join me as we journey through history and God's providence through other doors. In 1521, the same year that Magellan landed in the Philippines, a vast nobleman by the name of Ignatius of Loyola, born Inigo Lopez de Oñaz y Loyola, suffered a battle injury that cut his military career short. His life-changing experience resulted in a dramatic conversion that led to the founding of the Society of Jesus, presently the world's largest male religious order. The members of the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, as they eventually came to be called, set themselves apart from other religious orders of their time by not confining themselves to the cloisters. They set out into the world with one foot raised, in the words of Ignatius, by preaching, teaching, and witnessing to the gospel. At the time of Ignatius' death by age 65 in 1556, the little society that began with 10 men had about a thousand followers who were missioned as far away as Africa and Asia. In one of the more than 7,000 letters that Ignatius wrote in his lifetime, he advised his men in winning others over to the service of God to go in his door and come out of our own. Thus, the Jesuit missionaries who found themselves in new environments and cultures strove to immerse themselves in the language, customs, and the lives of the people they were trying to minister to. This inadvertently led to Jesuit missionaries becoming cartographers and compliers of many dictionaries of indigenous languages all over the world. Moreover, it allowed the Jesuits to both adapt and transform the new landscape that they traversed. And in walking through the many doors of the people they served and befriended, they forever changed history.
25 years after the death of Ignatius and four decades before his canonization, the first Jesuit missionaries came to the Philippines in 1581. The head of the mission, Father Antonio Sedeño, and his companions, Father Alonso Sanchez and Bro Nicolas Gallardo, had come at the request of Don Guido de Lavisares, the second governor of the Philippines, and Fray Domingo de Salazar, OP, its first bishop. They were instructed by then Jesuit Father General Mercurian to familiarize themselves with conditions in the colony and report on the advisability of establishing a permanent Jesuit mission. In 1594, Father Antonio Pereira, a Portuguese Jesuit who was passing by Cebu, lodged with the Augustinians who requested the Jesuits to establish a colegio in Cebu. Less than a year later, the Diocese of Cebu was established in 1595. Back then, the diocese comprised the whole Visayan Islands, Mindanao, Palawan, and Guam, and other Pacific Islands. The Royal Decree of April 27, 1594, placed Leyte, Samar, Bohol, and Negros under the spiritual administration of the Jesuits while Cebu and Panay were under the Augustinians. It was the Augustinians who invited the Jesuits to come to Cebu and open the proverbial door from which the Jesuits began their mission in the Diocese of Cebu. In 1595, Father Antonio Cedeno, Vice Provincial of the Jesuits who had arrived in the Philippines in 1581, came to Cebu to personally establish a central mission house he was accompanied by other Jesuits, Mateo Sanchez, Alonso de Humanes, and the lay brother, Hermano Gaspar. They opened a small school in Parian, the beginnings of what would later become Colegio de San Ildefonso. San Ildefonso was established in 1597 in what is now MJ Cuenco Avenue, the one beside Plaza Independencia. Three things can be said about San Ildefonso. Number one, it was like a day school and not a boarding school that offered lecture classes, but it was not a seminary or a higher institution of learning. Number two, it was owned and maintained by the Jesuits. And number three, it was a central house of the Jesuits for the Visayas missions. On November 29, 1625, a new church and residence replaced the old structure of San Ildefonso, built by light materials, and this was further replaced in 1725 by a fine-looking stone building. The Colegio eventually closed in 1769. The first bishop of Cebu, Pedro de Agurto, convened the first diocesan synod to determine the situation of his bishopric and thus gathered the clergy in the cathedral. According to historical accounts, one major matter decided by the synod was the revision of the catechism that was previously translated into Visayan. Two Jesuits who were experts in the language greatly helped in the revision of the catechism. The Jesuits' many apostolates and their commitment to learn the local language kept them in close contact with many lay Filipinos who worked alongside them. One of those is the Visayan proto-martyr Pedro Calungsod, a popular religious figure in the landscape of Visayan devotion, beatified by then Pope John Paul II. However, not so many know of the Jesuit who led the mission of which Pedro was part of, Father Diego Luis de San Vitores, who was beatified earlier in 1985. Padre Diego was of noble descent from Burgos, Spain. He was the head of a smaller group of companions 
who went to Guam for missions. At that time, Marianas was part of the jurisdiction of the Diocese of Cebu. The mission in the Marianas is the converging point of the lives of Padre Diego and Pedro Calungsud. We can only surmise that it was Padre Diego's special Jesuit charism that prompted the young Pedro Calungsud to join him as a young catechist. In the end, both teacher and student passed through the tragic but triumphant doors of martyrdom in Tumhon near Agadna, Guam on April 2, 1672. The Jesuits also established the mission area of Mandawe in 1638, which originally comprised present-day Mandawe City and what are now municipalities of Liluan, Consolacion, and Poro. But it was not until 1724 that a Jesuit priest was assigned as a parish priest in Mandawe. The Diccionario Geográfico of Bozeta and Bravo records a structure described as Mediana Fabrica, or mixed structure. Many believe this was a church built by the Jesuits in honor of Saint Joseph. When the Jesuits were suppressed and forced to leave their missions in 1768, the Recollects took over the parish until 1898. Interestingly, the current parish of Mandawe is still called the Parish of Saint Joseph. The Jesuits had a particular desire to minister to those in the margins. And in late 16th century, this included the Chinese who had decided to settle in the city. The brief participation of Cebu in the galleon trade in the 1590s brought into the locality visiting Chinese traders. Thus, the Chinese district of Barian was founded and evolved into a commercial or trading center. Jesuit historian Father William Repetti wrote that in 1596, there were 200 Chinese in Cebu, and only one of them was a Christian. It was missionary Father Pedro Quirino S.J., who devoted a great amount and effort to the catechizing and eventually baptism of these Chinese. These converts would then form the nucleus of the Parian parish. Although tradition holds that the Jesuits built a church in Parian, later Jesuit historians believe this to be a misconception. If any church was built, it was the community that the Jesuits ministered to and not necessarily a physical church. But by 1600, the Jesuits ceded their ministry with the Chinese in order to devote themselves to the mission in Mandawe. Even so, the members of the Chinese community continue to have recourse to them, not only for retreats, but also for regular spiritual conferences during the year. And that there was always a priest in the community capable of giving both retreats and conferences in the Chinese language. A living proof of the Jesuit presence in the Parian area is what has now survived as the House of 1730, situated between Zoweta and Binakayan streets. If we step through the main door of this house, hidden in the Hotong Hardware Warehouse in downtown Cebu, we get a glimpse of how the Jesuits lived. Jesuit historian Father René Haveliana explains that the house served more as a cabecera than a colegio. It was a meeting place of missionaries in the area. In 1759, the Jesuits were suppressed in Portugal, and the Pope, Clement XIV, suppressed the order in 1773. 
The suppression of the Jesuits by the Spanish crown came earlier in 1767. In the Philippines, it was implemented in 1768. The expulsion of the Jesuits from the country meant an end of their ministry. Though history would tell us that this door was only closed temporarily. Twenty twenty one is doubly significant to us Jesuits and to our lay collaborators. It was in 1521 when Christianity came to the Philippines through our Spanish colonizers. It was also in 1521 when St. Ignatius of Loyola experienced conversion after his leg was damaged by a cannonball. He would eventually found the Society of Jesus and as we know it, the rest is history. There is a connection between the two celebrations. Basically, our celebration of the 500th year of Christianity's presence in the Philippines is an invitation not only to thank God for the gift of faith, but also to reflect on what we have become and where we shall be going as a church. This is where the Ignatian year connects to the 500th year of Christianity. The church, and for this we may specifically mean the local church, is close to the heart of Ignatius. In fact, it is at the very heart of his mission. Since the nascent years of the order, there already was the commitment to the church and its mission through the Holy Father. It can be said, therefore, that the Society of Jesus has a special ecclesial vocation. But this is, in essence, due to the fact that her ultimate vocation is to Christ, in whom we live and move and have our being. In a world where the church is oftentimes seen in both ways as a sign of hope, but also a source of division, the call to exercise our ministry in the spirit of the gospel becomes all the more imperative for us Jesuits. The words of our general, Father Arturo Sosa, are thus apt a description to what we would like to strive on this Ignatian year to share more deeply with God's people the foundational experience by which the apostolic body of the society participates in the mission of reconciling all things in Christ. Yes, reconciling all things in Christ. This is the second point which I would like to stress in this reflection. Mending people's lives, reaching out to the outcast, and making oneself available as Jesus' sign of compassion. These are at the substantial core of the Jesuit vocation. It is shared by our lay collaborators, whether they work with us in schools, retreat houses, and centers of formation. 440 years ago, our brethren came to the archipelago and was among the earliest religious order to spread the word of God. The history of Philippine Christianity is also our history as Jesuits. We are reminded of the great achievements of the earliest missionaries that gave life to souls of bringing people closer to Christ our hope of glory. The history of the Jesuits in the Philippines, which we rekindle these days, remind us that ultimately, the reign of God is not found in temporal goods of the church, but in the heart of men. 
when Jesuits went to the fringes of society, where the frontiers of the missions were, they actually planted the seeds which we now call the Philippine Church. But in the margins, where the natives were, and where even rejection of the missionaries themselves were strongest, was Christ concretely manifest in flesh and blood with the unbaptized and even the nameless. My last point in this reflection is on the importance of interiority. What made the early Jesuit missionaries reach the farthest lands and even cross seas and rivers in order to bring the gospel of Christ Jesus was primarily not their training, nor their wit, nor their academic preparation, but the interior strength that they all had. An interiority that is founded on Jesus himself, from whom all good things come. To find God in all things, that is, to see all things anew in Christ, is the very reason for being of everything that was and has been written in the history of the order. Let me end my sharing with a few words borrowed from our Father General, Arturo Sosa. I find these same words as powerful an invitation for us to make more meaning as we continue celebrating our 500 years as a Christian community. The love of Jesus brings definitive healing. We can only be witnesses to that love if we are closely united to Him among ourselves and with those thrown aside by the world and considered least. Thank you.